Harvey. Uh, I would like to start immediately with the first question. Uh, in your book, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, you followed the development of the neoliberal economic doctrine during the last four decades, among other things, as a reaction to the so-called Keynesian compromise. You write about an interesting dichotomy, the one between the theoretical principles of neoliberalism on the one hand and their imp implementation and practice on the other, particularly when talking about the U.S. economic policy. Bearing in mind that the U.S. does not operate entirely according to ideological ne neoliberal principles when it comes to its internal affairs and that at the same time it urges other countries to maintain minimal gov government intervention into the so-called free market, how would you explain this dichotomy and what are its consequences for both the U.S. and other countries in the world? Big question. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think the best way to approach it is this, that... Uh, neoliberal politics in the United States uh, has to be understood as a class project. And as a class project, there are various uh, tactics which get adopted at various historical moments which are convenient. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, neoliberalism, theoretically, would not want to tolerate uh, high state indebtedness but Reagan, one of the first progenitors of this neoliberal turn, if you want to call it that, uh, was one of the first presidents to run up the debt, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. hugely. Uh, but then what, that were, what happened was that was then used as an excuse mm -hmm. uh, to cut the standard of living of working people mm -hmm. and to go after environmental regulation. So what that meant was if it was a convenient tactic in terms of uh, improving the condition of the capitalist class mm -hmm. uh, to go against the rules of neoliberalism by doing, in effect, a military Keynesianism. That's what you did. Uh, but then you used that as part of the class project of suppressing the wages and well-being of the mass of the population for the benefit of the upper classes. Now, George Bush, Jr. did exactly the same thing uh, later on. Uh, so that during the Bush years, there was no concern whatsoever for the deficit. So there was debt financing of two wars and tax cuts and all the rest of it. And they kept on saying that deficit, you know, Reagan taught us that deficits don't matter. So this is a tactic which is used, but it's a tactic which is used in relationship to a class project, which is the accumulation of wealth uh, and of income and power in a very small, an ever smaller group of the upper classes. So if you look at the distribution of income uh, in the United States since mid-1970s to now, what you'll see is a huge increase in the disparity to the point where, I can't remember the data exactly, but uh, about uh, the top 0.1% has something like 30% of the, of the GDP in its hands. And so it's, it's, it's a pretty astonishing performance. So if you see neoliberalization as a class project, uh, what you see is these tactical sw switches in terms of actual economic policy mm -hmm. and matching that. Now this goes on internationally mm -hmm. because I think what's happened is that the, uh, if you like, the, the, the bourgeoisie has become, in different countries, has become very enamored of this neoliberal project. Mm -hmm. So one of the things they do is they like the IMF to come in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they invite the IMF to discipline mm -hmm. uh, because, because then that allows them to say, it's not our fault that you poor people are getting screwed. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. the IMF that's doing yes, it. So it yes. looks like that. So again, it's a, it's a certain tactic. So what I see this uh, history as being is a history of tactical moves in a class war. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to cite this kind of comment of Warren Buffett when he was asked about class war. And he said, yes, of course there's class war, and it's my class, the rich folk, who are waging it, and we're winning. Yeah. And, and uh, that is effectively what neoliberalization has been about all along. And upper classes in other countries see the same thing. So mm -hmm. when Cameron comes to power mm -hmm. in Britain, he immediately goes to the neoliberalization kind of rhetoric because, and, and also because that is a way uh, to start to redis further redistribute income mm -hmm. to the upper classes. So mm -hmm. there was a survey that came out the other day of what's happened to the upper classes in Britain during the crisis. Nothing. They've done very well. 
they're mm -hmm. as rich as they've always been. You know, a couple of them have got hurt, but by and large, mm -hmm. they're doing very well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you you mentioned uh, all the, the role of uh, ex-president Reagan. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, what were the mechanisms and strategies involved in the implementation of the neoliberal principles, and what was the role of Chile? as some sort of neoliberal experiment polygon in the early 1970s? Again, uh, you have to look at this in class terms. I mean, there's mm -hmm. one myth, which is that the United States organized the coup in Chile. Mm -hmm. It didn't. Mm -hmm. The upper classes in Chile organized the coup with the support of the United States. They invited the Chicago boys, if yeah. I realize. Yes, they the then, but, but, only, but only after, this is only, you know, the, the coup occurred in 1973. And Chile was ruled by a junta, uh, and some members of the junta were in favor of Keynesian kinds of policies. Mm -hmm. uh, Pinochet was very close to the landed elites, mm -hmm. and eventually when he assumed total power, that's in 1975, that's when they brought in the Chicago boys. Mm -hmm. But they weren't brought in from Chicago, they were already there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the United States had this policy of training people from the global south. Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. took them to places like Chicago and Minnesota where they learned, mm -hmm. you know, monetarist theory and they already were at the Catholic University. So Pinochet then called these people over and said, okay, we will now uh, try the neoliberal experiment. And they did. And what was very interesting about it was, it started in 1977, they did all of these neoliberal moves according to the neoliberal book. And then in 1982, Chile crashed. Mm -hmm. In other words, neoliberalism didn't work mm -hmm. in its pure form. Mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher found the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the first few years of her, she was playing neoliberalism by the book, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. She would not have got re-elected mm -hmm. uh, if it had not been for the Malvinas War and all of the nationalism that went with that. So you then get this pragmatic neoliberalism, which is more about, you know, sort of support the upper classes. So Chile was very, very important uh, then as was uh, the revolution that occurred in the International Monetary Fund. Um, the neoliberals who came to power in the Reagan administration mm -hmm. wanted to abolish the IMF. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were going to do it, except that uh, Mexico went bankrupt in 1982, or was about to go bankrupt in 1982. Mm -hmm. So the IMF was then used, but they, what they did was they threw out all of the Keynesians mm -hmm. from the IMF in 1982, they did a purge and they brought in all of the monetarists from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then what you get is the disciplining of Mexico along classic neoliberal lines, which is to say, bail out the banks and squeeze the people. That is the policy of a structural adjustment program. So what we see is a practical neoliberalization, which is emerging through the IMF, which eventually gets centered, of course, through the Washington consensus. Mm -hmm. uh can you briefly explain the genesis of the financial crisis from 1970s onwards? Uh, are, are there any sequential regularities in the occurrence of crisis, and what is the role of uh, urbanization during the crisis period? Uh, what you see since the 1970s, I mean, from the period from 1945 to the mid-1970s, mm -hmm. there were very few financial crises. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, downturn, economic downturns and that kind of thing, but mm -hmm. very few financial crises. Uh, from the mid-1970s onwards, as neoliberalization became more and more part of how the global economy was working, we see more and more financial crises erupting around. Mm -hmm. So it was a period of great volatility. Mm -hmm. And some countries went through, I don't know, two or three uh, equivalent of bankruptcies. Mexico has been through two or three, Brazil through a couple. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a very volatile situation, but it was also a volatile situation that something hit here but didn't hit there. So it was geographically volatile, but also temporarily volatile. Mm -hmm. And what you see in, say, 1997, 98 was a massive crisis in East and Southeast Asia, uh, which didn't, ha it didn't go global. Uh, the United States managed to ward it off, so we in the United States would say, what crisis? Mm -hmm. you know, we're doing mm -hmm. fine, that's mm -hmm. their problem. The same thing with Argentina in 2001, 2002. You know, well, that's their problem, not our problem. So you get this incredible sort of volatility. And many of those crises are attached to uh, property market uh, crashes. Uh, 
the, the most obvious one was Japan. I mean, Japan was, if we were having this interview in 1980, everybody would be saying, well, Japan is the great country mm -hmm. to look at. It's the one that's the best, got the best uh, capitalist economy. They're about to rule the world. The Japanese banks are the top of the pile. Everything is going Japanese. Everything's organized Japanese style. And then in 1990, it went crash around land prices. And land prices have continued to go down ever since 1990. They've been doing it for 20 years. And Japan, Japanese economy, has never really recovered from, from that. It's just staggered along, a uh, very, very weak uh, kind of state. Uh, one of the big crises in the United States uh, between 1988 and 94 was the savings and loan crisis, which cost about $200 billion to, to get out of. So the state had to take over many financial institutions, I think something like 1,500, something of that order of, of, of banks were, went bankrupt in the United States during that period. And, and the housing market and the commercial market, it was mainly in commercial property that this happened, commercial market was, was, was really shot to hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, of course, you had the, the, the financial, the, the stock market crash of 1987. Mm -hmm. So there was a sort of way in which there was a, a movement between the property market difficulties and the stock market crash of mm -hmm. 1987. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but so again and again, you find these kind of relationships between what's going on in property markets, what's going on in stock markets in general, and what's going on with finance in general. And a lot of instability in the financial system has been uh, you know, connected to pro excessive property speculation. And of course, we saw that in 2004, 2005, running up to the Lehman Brothers collapse in 2008. That was very much property market uh, based. So. Uh, one of the arguments I like to make is you've got to look at what's going on in urban property markets because this, you know, housing and commercial property, mm -hmm. uh, if you really want to get a handle on, on where the next crisis is likely to come from. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in, in one of your lectures uh, you held in Chicago a few, few years ago, you mentioned uh, that capital, uh, capitalism never, never <coughs> sol uh, solves its crisis, uh, it uh, only moves them around geographically. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, if we bear in mind that uh, the, the huge discrepancies between uh, billionaires and people on the brink of their ex existence um, are, are present and, and uh, you, you pinpointed uh, uh, and stressed that uh, the, the, the richest man today lives in Mexico uh, and uh, we have a case, uh, very bizarre situation in India, for instance, the privatization of crop seeds, uh, which led at least uh, 250,000 Indian farmers to suicide due to the debt spiral they were caught into uh, by big transnational companies, such, yeah. such as Monsanto and uh, but it seems also that there is no visible tendency toward a structural change of the global economic system. We can only see ostensible solutions to the real problems, and these solutions, uh, but in quotation marks, are only uh, perpetuating the existing state of huge inequalities within the global economy. So what are the possible alternative solutions? Uh? Well, I think one of the things that's very interesting about this moment, uh, I was thinking about this the other day, uh, you know, in the 1930s, you had a massive crisis, and there was uh, a huge rethinking of almost everything as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a paradigm shift in economics uh, towards Keynesian thinking. Uh, public policy and the, the role of the state were rethought and reconfigured, so there was almost a revolution mm -hmm. in capitalist thinking. Uh, during the 1930s, which bore fruit after the Second World War and produced the, the long boom of, of the 1950s and 1960s. That r then ran into a certain kind of crisis. We can go into what, what, where that came from, if you like. Um, but then in the 1970s, there was another rethinking that went on. And much as I, I, you know, I don't have any sympathy with it, it the neoliberal revolution mm -hmm. was an revolution in thought. It was a revolution in how the state was positioning itself in relationship to social life and economic life. It was a revolution in you know, global relations and all the rest of it. So it was a real revolution in, 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 almost in ways of doing things. 
And we've just been through this new crisis, and you look, what is the bourgeoisie saying? It's not, it's not, it has come up with no new ideas at all. So the world is now divided between a, a kind of savage end game of the neoliberal trajectory, which we talked about, of savaging the people by, mm -hmm. uh, to the benefit of the, the upper classes, or a kind of nostalgic Keynesianism, which you know, some people in the United States look for and which Obama is trying to sneak in against Republican resistance, and, and it is actively being pursued in China. So, in other words, the, the two solutions, quote, solutions we have are in fact old solutions for a new situation. So there is no new thinking right now. Now this opens up opportunities, it seems to me, for people on the left mm -hmm. uh, to start to create new thinking. But the problem is, where, where are the resources and where are the think tanks on the left to do it? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that, for, you know, for instance, uh, Marxian theory is so completely sidelined that there's no way in which we can use that as a basis mm -hmm. at all because you know, there's hardly, there are no universities in the United States that really train people in this way of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is a few people start to train themselves and that's, mm -hmm. that's what we've got. So there's no coherent attempt to find any new solutions. Mm -hmm. and, and we have not managed uh, on the left to create uh, the think tanks and the, all the rest of it to create an alternative mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. political economy. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, I mean, for instance, George Soros has, mm -hmm. has set up an Institute for New Economic Thinking, mm -hmm. which is heterodox Keynesian. Mm -hmm. It's nothing more than that. So it's not radical at all, mm -hmm. it's heterodox Keynesianism. So it's a kind of version of Keynesian nostalgia. <laughs> Uh, which is being being pursued, and you know, and I think there is something that could be progressive about this. I mean, somebody said to me, "What's wrong with that?" And I said, "Well, what would I prefer to live under? A sort of a heterodox Keynesian, or, or the end game of neoliberalism?" And frankly, I'd rather live under a heterodox Keynesianism than, than, than so. There is a, there is a certain choice uh, of this sort. So I I think uh, you know. There is, there is a lack of alternatives around right now. Mm -hmm. And people like myself uh, have been effectively isolated in academia for a very long time. And only now uh, are some people beginning to listen to the sorts of things that I have to say. But, you know, I'm just one individual. We need a, a collective movement. And my problem with much of what's going on on the left is it's very much about you know, philosophical questions yes. and, and abstract Too theory abstract, right. and it's not about, well, actually, how is, uh, how is this going to be done and what is going to be done and how are we going to organize the economy yeah. along yeah. radically different lines. Like and they're living in their own ivory towers. Yes, yeah. yes. So there's, a, there's, a, there's too much of that. Mm -hmm. going, I mean, I'm glad they're doing what they're doing, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, that, it, it doesn't it doesn't really address the problem that I think you're getting at, which is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, what are the tangible solutions? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there are social movements that are exploring tangible solutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And their, their problem, however, is that, that the knowledge base upon which they're organizing those tangible solutions are, are not very strong. So mm -hmm. there has to be much better communication between people like myself and those social movements. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things we need to cultivate in, uh, in the coming year or years. So, uh, if we take that, all that in, uh, into consideration, uh, where do you see the role of uh, inde independent media, for instance, uh, uh, when confronting this issue? Uh, well, you know, um, it, it, it's a very positive thing to have mm -hmm. uh, these uh, independent forms of media uh, open and, and clearly mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, a, a great utility uh, for it. I mean, uh, the fact that I have a website and I can put, mm -hmm. and I have these Marx courses on the web and so on, uh, you know, I mean, I, and the fact that in, independent media are, are reporting on things that don't get reported in the mainstream mm -hmm. is very good. The, the, of course, the problem, however, is that um, you know the, the web is is so full of excess information, and some of it is downright lies and fantasy that it's sometimes very difficult. And even crackpot theories. Crackpot so theories as well. It's very difficult to kind of 
get on there and, and, and quickly find what, is, what are reliable sources of information. So I think the more that, that the independent media builds a confidence with an audience that, that they're going to provide mm -hmm. good and, and, and steady stream of, of information, mm -hmm. the more that happens, I think, the better it will be. But uh, there's a lot of craziness goes on at the web. And, and frankly, searching the web takes a lot of time. Uh, mm -hmm. some, you know, you kind of go, you can spend a day so just Googling things, and then you come out at the end of the day and say, what did I learn? Yes. Sometimes it's not very much. Uh, yes. Sometimes it's great, you know, so yes. it's a little bit hit or miss. Yes. So let us move to the next question. Uh, at the round table under the title, The Meaning of Maghreb, that was held two days ago, you said that the phrase Arab Spring could be replaced by the phrase the autumn of capital. Yeah. Uh, can you please explain what did you mean by that, and uh, do you see any any possible uh, potential for alternative solutions, which we were be uh, we, 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 we we were uh, discussing? Uh, well, I think I think you know pretty much everywhere around the world uh, there are social movements in motion, which are attempting to address one, I think, basic simple fact that people are not getting adequate uh, means to reproduce themselves at a level which is uh, basically consistent with being human. Mm -hmm. and, and to the degree that all of those movements have that common base, uh, and we say to ourselves, well, we're living in a capitalist society, then you would say that capitalism has fundamentally failed. Uh, and the struggle in Egypt is partly about, you know, the ones that our media likes to emphasize. It's about freedom and liberties of speech and getting rid of dictatorial authority and that kind of thing. But I don't believe for a minute that it would have gone as far as it's gone without there being a very strong support from the labor movement and also from the popular movements who are mostly concerned, I would suspect, over food prices. And, and the fact that they have no kind of prospects of improving their standards of living and, and that their standards of living, if anything, are getting worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to the degree that, that there's a movement of some kind, it's going to for, try to force the system uh, to do a much better job of, of providing for basic, basic needs and, 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 and the like. Um, I mean, I think what's happening in Egypt, for example, as you went through the stage of getting rid of Mubarak and, and all of that, now they're up against the big problem, which is how is the economy going to be reorganized when much of the economy is actually organized by the military? And, and, and that economy is sort of oligopolistic, but inserted into capitalism in certain kinds of ways. So there's going to be, at some point, a rather a confrontation with uh, how the economy is structured and who has the power mm -hmm. in relationship to the economy and mm -hmm. how, how that economy can be better uh, orchestrated uh, to you know, deliver health care, education, uh, basic foods and shelter and all this kind of thing to the mass of the population which is trying mm -hmm. to live on a dollar a day probably or something of that sort. So I think that at some point or other uh, if they can solve that problem, it's going to be by pushing capitalism to its limits, uh, if not beyond. And so I, I see it as, uh, okay, it's a struggle which is embedded in Egyptian, you know, the Egyptian situation, but at a certain point it's going to confront the whole kind of mm -hmm. capitalist system. And, and so, to me, the more those struggles emerge, and you see them there, I mean, there are huge peasant struggles going on in India, Mm -hmm. uh, and of course there are all of the kind of movements going on in Latin America, so when you start to look globally you see all of these movements which are uh, bubbling, as it were, mm -hmm. seeking for a, a different kind of positionality, and in so doing they're bound to get into some sort of conflict of talk uh, with capital, and, and bound at some point or other to pose the question on the ground, what is the alternative to this system that cannot provide uh, goods for the, for, you know, I don't know, two billion of the world's population, which is living on less than two dollars a day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let's, let's move to, to a slightly uh, different issue, uh, which is also an area of your expertise. Uh, that of uh, the right to the city. Mm -hmm. uh, very recently here in Zagreb we had a very good example of private interest working under the mask of public interest and civic improvement. In, other, in order to build an un underground parking garage for shopping mall visitors, one part of the pedestrian zone of the street in the center of the city was devastated. People were protesting, among protesters there were architects, uh, yes, right. uh, urbanists, uh, uh, actors, uh, university professors, all, 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 all sort of people. Uh, and um, the, uh, the underground parking garage was, uh, however, built, and now we have yet another shopping mall. And, and a similar tendency exists also in Dubrovnik, Split, and other Croatian cities. So uh, my question for you is how fundamental is the right to the city, uh, and uh, how can citizens of any city gain a greater democratic control over the development of the city they live in? I, I'm not... Act, uh, I'm not uh, asking you to give us a blueprint, but uh, maybe some clues and... Yeah. Well, the idea of the right to the city is what we might call an empty signifier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it therefore depends very much upon who fills it with meaning. I'm sure the developer of your shopping mall said, well, I have a right to the city and That's I'm exercising true. my right, right to the city and I'm doing it in a way which is for the good of all citizens because I'm going to create jobs and I'm going to improve blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, part of the struggle over the right to the city is a right to define what it actually means. Mm -hmm. And I was at the World Urban Forum down in Rio uh, a year ago last March, and uh, there were many elements within the United Nations that wanted to co-opt the phrase right to the city mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. a kind of very bourgeois, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of uh, conventional kind of notion of, uh, of, of rights. Mm -hmm. So there is a struggle over meaning. And so one of the things I would want to do is to struggle and say, well, the right to the city is the right of homeless people to have homes and, and, and then start to move through the social strata and the right of people to circulate in the city how they want. And you know, it's very important, I think, to understand that, that in this fight over the right to the city, and you know, Marx has this wonderful line when he talks about, you know, rights. He kind of says, between equal rights, force decides. Mm -hmm. So one of the big questions for the left is how to mobilize a force in such a way that you can have the decisive say. Mm -hmm. And in that process, it seems to me you may often lose uh, a battle, but you don't necessarily lose the war. Yes. And I think that, my, I, you know, you, you're from here, I would ask you to some degree, to, to, the, to the degree that those protests took place, mm -hmm. did, did you notice at some point or other that people started to look upon the city in a different kind of way, even though you lost on that particular thing? Yeah, yeah. And people start to actually the use the city in a the very public different way. Awareness. The public awareness uh, and the public use of the city yeah. starts to change and mm -hmm. people start to feel that simply because people use the rhetoric of the right to the city, that they have a right to come into the city and be in the city. And I don't know, hang out and do things. In other words, there's a way in which uh, it seems to me that by creating these battles can focus public awareness and even though the power relation is against you and you mm -hmm. might lose, mm -hmm. you, you, might, you might just lose the battle but you might win the war mm -hmm. to the point where the public administration mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the city has to recognize that the citizens are mm -hmm. now considering themselves citizens of this space mm -hmm. and the public administration better take care not to offend their sensibilities too much in the future. So I, th I think this, I, you know, there's, it's, 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 it's a long-standing kind of, you know, there are lots of uh, wars of position, as Gramsci would call it, mm -hmm. that go, go on around mm -hmm. this concept of the right to the city. And I think it's strategically very important uh, to focus on particular struggles that raise that consciousness, raise that awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where more and more people can become engaged in, in you know, exercising some kind of right of determination as to what, uh, what happens uh, uh, within the urban space. That's a rather optimistic view. And yes. Uh, and since we're uh, running out of time, uh, I would like to ask you one more questions, uh, question. Um, 
international, uh, international relations uh, uh, theoreticians <coughs> mainly focus on what you call uh, territorial logics of power. Besides that, uh, you also discern the notion of capitalist logics of power. Can you briefly, uh, in a few minutes, explain uh, the differences and similarities of these two notions? If you're sitting, in a, if you're an investment banker, mm -hmm. and, and you suddenly find yourself controlling a million dollars, and you're sitting in New York City, mm -hmm. um, what do you do with the money? Now, money is what I call uh, the butterfly form of capital. Mm -hmm. It fits around all over the place. So, as far as you're concerned, you'll say, well, where is the profit rate highest? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think maybe it'd be better to invest in Thailand or in China or Australia or wherever. Mm -hmm. So you don't, just because you're in New York City, you don't think you're going to invest in the United States. So as a financier, you just put your money wherever, it, you know, it looks like it's going to be most, uh, most profitable. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the statesmen of the United States don't necessarily like that because to the degree that development goes to China, uh, economic power goes to China, and mm -hmm. so the statesmen kind of say, well, you can't do that. Um, but then, you know, the financiers say, okay, well, we'll finance your next election provided you don't mind that we do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the financiers, for example, played a very important role in the deindustrialization of the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I lived in this city of Baltimore in 1969. It's a blue-collar city, 37,000 people employed in the steel industry, uh, about 5,000 people employed in shipbuilding. You know, it just went round like that. You know, 20 years later, it's all gone. It's all gone because... Due to outsourcing. Yeah, you've gone to outsourcing or technological change mm -hmm. or something of that kind. And, you know, the major firms have gone bankrupt and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But the financiers are doing very well because they suck the capital out of that and then they sent it to somewhere mm -hmm. else or, you know. So this is what I mean about a conflict between how well Baltimore does as a mm -hmm. city and how well the capitalists are doing. Mm -hmm. And the capitalists can do very well and the territory in which they reside can do very badly. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some capitalists in yeah. Greece right now who are doing extremely well. That's true. Uh, at same the same in time. India, same, same in Brazil. Yes, yes right. So what we have, it seems to me, is, a, is, is different logics of power, mm -hmm. uh, one of which is simply about money making, and mm -hmm. the other is about uh, accumulating wealth within, a, within mm -hmm. a particular territory, and they don't necessarily go together. Yes. Professor Harvey, I would like to thank you very much for this thank conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure.